These are some photos that we took on our extended tour of the Titan II Missile Museum just south of Tucson, Arizona. The Titan II is an intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, there are none left. This last one was turned into a museum. It's, miss, it's a, a missile number, or the silo is number 571-7 of the 390th Strategic Missile Wing and all the rest were destroyed. This one was left as a museum. The museum's open every day. Uh, the tour that you can take every day is about an hour. This extended tour that these photos are from, um, they do a couple of times a month and they let you into the crew quarters and then underneath the missile to look up, um, up the silo. So these pictures have been sort of random, but I'll start to describe what we're looking at in these photos. Um, we're, again, we're looking at a Titan II, which is the intercontinental ballistic missile. It could take a nine megaton bomb and take it about 9,000 miles. We had them in Tucson, we had them in Arkansas, and we had them in Kansas and they could reach across to Russia during the Cold War. Um, they were replaced by the Minutemen and they came in after the Titan ones. This is what it would have looked like from the outside. This is the silo complex. Um, of course, there would have been less vehicles if it was ready to go. It only took about 60 seconds for those blast doors to open and that missile to launch once the, the buttons were pushed. There were 18 of them here in Tucson. They were under the 390th um, uh, strategic missile wing. And we want to take a moment, of course, to thank the launch crews and maintenance support teams. Without them, you know, of course, these would have never been able to run and do their job. Um, they were completely underground, so this drawing shows the complex. On the right there is the eight-story deep silo with the Titan II missile, then the tube connecting it to the stairway and elevators, the access hatch there in the center. And then over on the left is the crew quarters and the control room. And then that access, or that pipe going up, on the very far left is the escape hatch. It was completely underground and the tour takes us through the crew compartments on the left and the silo itself. Again, these were under the 390th uh, strategic missile wing and uh, they were manned by both male and female crews. Most of them still work at the silo and at the museum, so we want to again give thanks to those crews. Um, when we start the tour, we start inside at the museum and uh, get some information about the missiles uh, about the silos, about the crews, about how they were used, um, you know, why they were needed, um, luckily why we never needed to use them, and again some procedures and just a lot of good information before you get out into the heat and into the act to see the actual equipment out there. Um, um, you see sort of a video and you get a chance to talk to some of the people that actually worked in the silos. This is a model of the eight stories of the silo and what the story, what the different stories were for. So once you're done inside, they take you outside as a group and the, the museum was, wasn't there of course when it was operational but this is pretty much what it would have looked like with all its antennas up. Normally um, the antennas wouldn't all be up. Um, so they take you as a group and they walk you around the area and talk about the various structures. Um, I took some pictures of these different um, antenna silos because those are still in existence at some of the other um, silos that are out there. Even though they've been destroyed, those concrete areas are left. That's the Doppler radar, so they could tell if anybody was messing around on the surface. Uh, that's what one of the antennas looks like in the up position. And again, there's signs there that describe what you're looking at because event that you don't have to look at everything as a group. You can walk around and look on your own. The escape hatch now has an air uh, duct going down to provide fresh air. And again, some more of the hardened uh, antenna silos. This red bucket is because you weren't allowed to have firearms there, you would be able to discharge your firearm or put your firearm away safely. Some of the vehicles they would have used, um, you know, vehicles from the 80s. Um, that's again a view of the missile doors, of the silo doors. Um, the fuel would have normally just been there while it was fueling up, but, I took, but it was an interesting truck and, and everything, so I took a bunch of pictures of this. Um, again, you get to walk all around it. It's one of the better types of museums. There's not a lot of ropes that say don't touch. Of course, you're not supposed to touch anything, but you can walk right up to it. It's really a great museum for that. Really interesting stuff. Again, they used a better fuel than the Titan ones, and so this equipment wouldn't have been there most of the time. This would have just been if they needed to fuel it up or defuel it or something. A lot of safety stuff going on, so um, that's what those areas were for. Um, sometimes to get to these remote locations they'd use the UH-1 Huey. It's one of my favorite helicopters so I took a few pictures of it. 
course it's all painted up like strategic air command so that's kind of neat um, probably for maintenance or you know any kind of emergencies when people are screwing around they could get out there quickly with the helicopter they also use these little jeeps air force jeeps again because it's a museum they have you know more there than would normally have been there and one of the exhibits on top is uh, the jets so you get to see what the rocket engines look like and how they were used and of course these weren't small these were you know designed to go into space so you can see they're fairly large the guys that do run the tours of course a lot of times they either worked on these they knew quite a bit about it so the doors themselves have this sort of glass roof built over them now they have to stay open so that the russians can look from space and see that we're not you know turning them back into a silo so it's got a big hole cut in the side uh, if you look down there there's a some mannequins set up to look, you know, to give you some sense of scale and to show what it's like when they were maintaining it. That's a window down there with someone taking a picture at me, and you can take uh, from a, the next picture here. You can see where that window is a couple of stories down, and pretty soon we'll be in that window taking a picture back up to where I'm standing taking this picture. So that's pretty neat. Um, that's a picture of the blast doors, big giant steel doors. This picture doesn't have anything to put it into perspective, but giant doors. Again, in the last picture looking down, um, there's a picture with the reflection in the glass. If you get too far away, you end up getting a picture of yourself taking a picture. That's the blast doors, giant steel and concrete. Um, I forget how many tons, but very large. Again, signs to tell you what you're looking at. And for the most part, this is all still intact. It's a little different than when it was operational. Uh, of course, the hydraulics are gone. But this door would open again in 60 seconds. That missile was out of there, so nothing around here moved slow, I don't think. Again, looking at another view of what it looked like, we're about to go down that center section, down the staircase, and then to the left, into the round egg-shaped uh, crew quarters, we'll see the computers and then go up to the living quarters, and then go all the way across the tunnel down into the silo. So from the, from the surface, that square section in the center looks like just a piece of metal, and here it is with its door open and the elevator open, up top. The elevator would pop up out of nowhere, and allow you know large equipment or in this case people that didn't weren't able to take the stairs we could get on the elevator to go down so as a group they explain to us you know what we're about to do and where we're about to go and most of us will go down the stairway because someone was going down the elevator I went on the elevator this time there's a picture looking down the stairway and then a picture looking back up the stairway and again that's pretty much all you would have seen from the surface is a, a metal lid of course, like, just like in the movies, there's a video camera. You clearly can't get into this area without them knowing who you are and going through the procedure. Um, like I mentioned, I got to go down the elevator, so here's a couple of shots to try to show the scale of that stairway going down. But I forget how many you know, feet. It's a couple of flights down, though. Once you get down there, there's this blue telephone, and we saw in a video earlier the procedure that they'd go through again with the video cameras and telephone to you know, show who they were. And then they would open these very large steel doors that, if I remember right, they can take a, a blast eight times larger than Hiroshima. So, you know, giant concrete and steel doors. And, of course, they are huge, but you can operate them, you know, just by a couple of fingers. You can just push them open and close real easily. So that's a picture of the blast doors and the locking hinges. Um, you know, just like in the movies, they were locked in there for good. They didn't want a nuclear blast to come by and, and knock the missile out. And when the missile launched, they didn't want it to fall apart and kill the crew. So those doors were to protect the crew as well. So once we get down to the tunnel there, um, we get to see basically some of the construction. It's all shock absorbers and um, suspended cables and things, again, to absorb any kind of shock that might happen from either the missile going off or somebody shooting a missile to try to you know, knock out this missile silo. Um, this is going into the crew quarters, the control room actually, looking at some of the technology, some of the computers. Again, this is in the early, you know, from the 50s through the 60s and 80s. So this is some older computing, computing technology. That's somebody pushing the button. Um, this is, again, some of the computers and control uh, things. There's a safe there. And again, just like in the movies, two people, two combinations, two locks, two keys. You know, two people have to turn the switch um, so that no one can set one of these off on their own. There was some information there about, you know, the duties that they'd perform and the different maintenance and the responsibilities each of the crew would have while they were, you know, assigned to the um, living underground with the missile. Another place where they could safely clear a weapon. 
Uh, I thought it was neat to see a telephone in there, uh, just a regular dial phone, but of course it was for use inside the nuclear missile silo. Again, some of the shock absorbers, this all this this whole area was sort of separated from its outside walls, the floors and what suspended um, from the outside walls. The crew, I guess, when they were in their quarters, they could take off their overshirts and their hats there, so they would leave them. And they kind of showed what it would be like. There's some access panels that come up through the floors to move big equipment around, um, very much like a ship um, in there. Those are some radios. Those are the stairways going up and then going down. We weren't allowed to go down, but we were allowed to go up these stairs uh, up into the crew quarters. So we were just on the control room level. The downstairs level is computers. The upstairs level is crew quarters. This is a picture of the kitchen. You can see that roof is sort of an egg shape. Um, so the walls inside ended, and then there was that black weather stripping that would you know, become a shock absorber or a flexible barrier between the outside wall and then the inside structure. And again, you can see the different shock absorbers and suspension systems everywhere. Now we're going to leave the crew quarters and head across towards the silo. And there's this very long tunnel with a bunch of blast doors that would all be closed most of the time. So in case that missile went off or exploded accidentally, the crew survived. There was all these expansion joints and areas so that again it could withstand the shock of a nuclear blast or just the vibration of the sh of its own missile going off. Um, a lot of cables and wires and whatnot going through that long uh, tunnel. So once you're over there, it's nothing but you know pipes and wires and um, ladders and Entry, you know, entryways and exitways and shock absorbers. This thing is a cross between a, a, a ship and a spaceship. I don't know it, any other way to describe it. It was definitely a complex area with lots, lots and lots and lots of moving parts. So a lot of things were labeled, um, redundant systems, and again, there, there were diagrams like this to show us what was going on, but you'd really need to spend a long time to really keep track of what all was going on. Now those are those mannequins um, that we saw from the top. There's a, a, a emergency shower um, that we'd see quite often because most of these materials were toxic. These mannequins are set up to show how they would work on the, the missile. Um, then we got to go, because this is the extended tour, into this elevator and go down underneath the missile and look up at it. So this is standing under it where you might work on the jets and Looking up again the silo, you can see where those floors come down so they could work on the missile. This is one of the places where the actual missile sets on the silo. So it's just a couple of spots like that that this whole giant missile sat on. Uh, here's where the jets would have been. And you can see that they're, you know, accessible from this level that we're standing on. Uh, if you look down from where we were standing, of course, it was the giant um, complex area where the exhaust would go. So again, looking back up the silo where they're, they've got the maintenance floors down, and then looking back up the silo where it's clear, and you can see up to the sky. And um, again, this is a pretty neat part of the extended tour. It's definitely worth going on a couple of times a month when they have it available. And then last shot there of looking down at the silo. And again, we just wanted to show our thanks to the, the crews and the maintenance support teams that kept these things running. And again, luckily we never had to use them, but it's nice to know they were there if uh, we ever would have. So it's worth it taking the time to see the tour. Um, it's just south of Tucson.